The finish line is in sight for the 44th federal election. It's been a campaign that's been overridden by one nagging issue. Why are we having this election? It was something the liberals underestimated and it left the opposition an opening. Will it work? Hello and welcome to the Unpublished TV. I'm Ed Hand. We're coming to you from a remote location and practicing physical distancing to enhance safety. The 36-day campaign saw the Liberals holding an eight-point lead on the Conservatives at the beginning and hoping for a majority. Now, Trudeau is in a statistical tie with Aaron O'Toole and the Conservatives. And this election comes a little bit different. For one, those on the right side of the political spectrum have a choice in the Tories or the People's Party of Canada. And the growth of the PPC has been eye-opening. Add to the mix, Jagmeet Singh's second election, and in this final week has seen some growth. Then again, there's the Green Party that was hoping for renewed optimism and support only to have its campaign derailed by infighting. The Bloc Québécois has seen some enthusiasm for its message coming courtesy of a moderator's debate question in the last leader's debate. Our unpublished vote question asked, did the federal leader's national debates help you decide who to vote for? 32.2 said yes, 60.6 said no. 5.2 5.2 said maybe, and 1.9 unsure. However you're watching and listening to our show, whether through our social media channels on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube, our podcast channels, iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, iHeartRadio, and more, I'd like to remind you, you can still cast your vote on this top, get unpublished on vote, and then email your MP to tell them why. Joining us to discuss the election campaign, Warren Kinsella, political commentator and special advisor to Prime Minister Jean Chrétien. Daryl Bricker, CEO of Ipsos Public Affairs, Scott Gilmore, columnist with McLean's, and Stephanie Schwinnard, assistant professor of political science at Queen's University. And, and Stephanie, we'll, we'll start with you. Was there ever really a reason to have this election? There was a reason, but the prime minister could not say what it was without looking too crass, I think. Uh, the, the reason for this election was very clear. They saw an opening uh, to, to get a majority and they thought they should go for it. And uh, the Delta variant caught up with them, uh, which meant that throughout this entire election, we were left with this question that remained vaguely answered, which was, was there really uh, a, a, a reason other than to try to get a majority in parliament for this election. Scott, this what time. did you think about that? You know, this is probably the first election that I've paid almost no attention to so in my, on my entire adult life. And the reason is, is that I have been working with a group of vets for the last month, desperately trying to evacuate about 2,000 Afghan families who've been supporting Canada's mission over the last 20 years. And the reason we're doing this is because the civil service is paralyzed right now. We're the only ones that can set up the safe houses. We're the only ones that can manage the crossings to the border. And it's because there's nobody minding the store. They're in the midst of an election. So the civil servants are basically operating on autopilot, which means that there's more journalists or the journals are spending more time trying to save Afghans right now than the prime minister and his cabinet have been. So, yeah, my feelings on this are pretty strong and they're pretty clear. This, ne- this election was not necessary. And in fact, calling this election when, he, when uh, the prime minister did is, you know, frankly, it, it, it's indefensible. Now, Daryl, you've been obviously following this since the beginning. And actually, your numbers showed as this campaign went on, more and more Canadians felt that this was really unnecessary, right? Right. So we asked at the start of the campaign, do you think we should be having this election at this time? 56% of Canadians said no. Interestingly, mostly liberals. Mm -hmm. Opposition opposition voters actually wanted at the prime minister, so they were less likely to say no. So it was mostly liberals. And today, so yesterday, when we released our last uh, survey results uh, in the public environment, that number gone up to 69. Now, I've never seen that happen before. Usually what happens is after the start of a campaign, people kind of get on with the business of, uh, you know, deciding how to vote and, you know, working through everything that's going on in the campaign. And by the end of it, uh, people are, uh, uh, have forgotten why it was called and it has very little uh, effect on the results. This time it was the exact converse. Um, it's, it, the, that number has gone up through the course of the campaign. 60% of liberals today think that we shouldn't be having this election. So, uh, you know, I don't know what they were doing in terms of assessing how the public would react to this, but they clearly missed it. Uh, Warren, uh, the going into, obviously, uh, Election Day, the, the Liberals and the Conservatives were are pretty well neck and neck. 
Uh, but, you know, going into this 36 days ago, uh, the Liberals had a, a, an eight point lead. How did the Conservatives make up that ground? Well, governments defeat themselves. And Mr. Trudeau has been busily defeating himself since he stepped out in front of Rideau Hall on that sunny day to announce that he was having an election about nothing. And so in the interim, in this exceedingly short campaign, I've been talking, I do have actually some liberal candidate friends. I will not name them because they would prefer I don't. And um, they've told me that what they get at the doors is something like the following, uh, you know, further to what Daryl has said. Um, I like you, blank. I have voted for you in the past, blank. But I'm not going to vote for you this time because I'm mad at your boss for calling an election during a pandemic. And my friends who I speak to don't have a response to that. And so, you know, as all of your guests have pointed out, it's critically important that you have a response to that, you know, and, and, and like from the outset, stepping out and saying it was critical, no, pivotal and and consequential. Those are the words he used over and over again. At the precise moment that Kabul was falling, and as Scott was pointing out, we're leaving behind people who literally risk their lives to assist us. Like it, it is, um, I think he's going to be punished. You know, David Peterson, 1990, Jim Prentice in 2014. I feel it in my gut. Uh, it's not a poll, but I feel it's coming. He's going to get a punishment. All right. Now, uh, Stephanie, uh, the, the People's Party of Canada, obviously fairly new to the to the landscape, but obviously their their numbers were, were growing. Can they siphon enough votes from the Conservatives to make a difference? I think there's a few places in the country where uh, where they might have an impact. And I'm uh, thinking of the polls I saw over the weekend, uh, particularly in Alberta, where uh, we saw the PPC come through in a uh, in a surprising manner. Now, obviously, I don't think they'll have much of an impact uh, in Edmonton Center or even in Calgary. But in rural ridings in Alberta, I think uh, I think the the Conservatives might feel that pinch. Will it be enough uh, to uh, let NDP or Liberals come through in those ridings? That's uh, that's really unclear. And we know that uh, in Alberta, the Conservative vote is so concentrated. You see uh, candidates win with seventy and eighty percent of uh, the total vote in, in their writings. So uh, even a 20% PPC might uh, leave the Conservatives unscathed. Uh, but it, it does, uh, I think, raise some, some questions for, uh, for the Conservatives, especially as uh, we're seeing this party trying to pivot towards the center and uh, Aaron O'Toole bleeding some votes uh, to, uh, to the right of his base. Uh, and, and, and we're seeing this. The one question I think we all have at this point is, uh, are what we're seeing in the polls going to manifest at the ballot box? Because mm -hmm. with an anti-institution, anti-system kind of party like the People's Party, uh, what we're hearing in the polls uh, does not always translate the same way as we see with other kinds of voters. So uh, it's still a big question mark. And I think a lot of people are wondering what's actually going to happen with uh, Mr. Bernier and his team uh, tonight. What do you think, Scott? You know, a lot a lot of the people, uh, the PPC supporters, I'm not going to say anti-vaxxers, but certainly questioning mandatory vaccines and vaccine passports. Um, do you see them taking away some of the conservative support, especially right on the right? Well, you know, I think maybe Daryl might be able to put some light on this, in particular in terms of how motivated the PPC voter is versus the liberal voter or the, the NDP voter. So I'm sitting in Ottawa Centre every year when I go to vote, well, not every year, but every election when I go to vote, it's two minutes in and out of the local school. But now the polls have actually been moved to the nearby university, so I'm gonna have to drive there. And according to Twitter, there's an over an hour long line to, to get there. And by the time I get there end of the day, it could be much longer. And so I suspect we're gonna see a lot of Canadians are gonna show up at the polling station or they're gonna be heading to the polling station, they're gonna hear this. And unless they're really, really motivated to stand there for an hour, they're they're going to drop away. So yeah. So over to Daryl. Like, who is the most motivated uh, voter out there right now that's willing to stand in line for an hour to cast their vote on an inconsequential election? Conservative right. voters. Conservative voters. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So we. Uh, uh, yeah. The the and Warren was on this, and actually Scott, you talked about it as well. I mean, the the real driver of voting in this election is people's reaction to how it was called. And um, so the people who really are most motivated, so we ask people um, uh, in a variety of ways, because the single biggest 
issue in polling these days is not saying how somebody is going to vote. It's figuring out actually who is going to vote. So um, turnout has become a really difficult problem in, the, in, uh, in trying to predict election outcomes. So we asked poll, uh, we asked turnout in a whole series of ways. Uh, you know, one to, on a scale of one to 10, you know, will you regret not voting? Tell us if you're going to vote. Do you know where you're voting, you know, where you're supposed to vote? We ask a whole bunch of things to figure out whether or not people are going to be voting. And everything that we're asking, conservatives are consistently five or six points ahead of the liberals on that. Hmm. So uh, let's cut it in half and say that maybe they have a two point or one, one and a half point potential ballot box bonus um, through the course of the election campaign. Um, those are the people who seem to be the most motivated. The other most voted, motivated voters, and they weren't most motivated until the space of the last two weeks were Bloc Québécois voters. Um, so uh, I think, uh, I don't know who mentioned the debate. It really seems to have put some energy into the block campaign. And uh, I don't know what the motivation is for liberal voters. Uh, it seems to me that the Sturm and Drang campaign that was run by the liberals about, uh, you know, the hordes coming over the, uh, the hill and, you know, taking Canada back and all that hasn't really had much of an impact. It's hard to find a lot of passion in the liberal vote right now. So when you add all of this, all of this up, what does it lead to? I don't know, but it's something that I'm watching really closely as we're going through, uh, you know, we're doing an exit poll and, and, and take, trying to get some sense of what's going on. But I know that going into this, uh, into the uh, in, into the actual election today, that there was a bit more momentum behind the conservatives. Now, the other thing is mail-in ballots. Who was most likely to do that? Seems a little bit more liberal and a little bit more NDP. So it seems to be a little bit more progressive. In our advanced balloting, what we're seeing, and there's, is, is a, there's a bit of an advantage for the Conservatives. So how does this all add up? I don't know. Uh, just to give people some numbers to work with, there's about 18 million people who voted in the last election. Advanced ballots are only about 800,000, or sorry, um, mail-in ballots are only about 800,000. So it's around 4%. So, and it's not the same from everywhere. There's a disproportionate number, for example, from British Columbia. We know that because... Uh, Elections Canada is reporting where they've received them. And they had experience with uh, with the last provincial election because there was a lot of mail-in balloting then. It's lower this time, but it's it's higher in BC than just about anywhere else. So how does all of this play out? I mean, you tell me. It's like Rubik's Cube. I can't, uh, trying to figure out how all it fits together. But those general points I just made seem to be somewhat valid um, in terms of consistency, in terms of what we're finding. Warren, you've kept an eye on on Alberta, and there's another new party out there, the Maverick Party. Uh, didn't really take off like the reform, did it? No, they're non-existent. I went looking for them because I was worried about their well-being, and I couldn't find them. Um, but, you know, that happens in a democracy. You get these protest parties and so on. Insofar as the People's Party is concerned, I personally, and I should disclose, <laughs> I'm being sued by their leaders, so I have to exercise some caution here. But as a consequence of that lawsuit, I've learned a little bit about them and their workings and so on. You know, their orientation two years ago was intolerance, really. I think that was the brand that they had embraced. Two years later, it's this anti-mask, anti-vaccine, anti-social distancing thing. The thing that I don't know the answer to, but I'm watching for today, as well as my colleagues at Post Media, is, well, if they don't you know, want to mask up and they don't want to social distance, how are they going to vote? Just the simple mechanism of voting, because what's going to happen is if they show up at a polling station and refuse to mask up as a consequence of provincial regulation, well, they're not going to be allowed to vote. So I think there's an assumption that a lot of people have made that the People's Party kind of person is going to vote. But I'm not so sure that that is the case. They don't like democratic institutions. So are they going to embrace the democratic institution of voting? I don't know. Stephanie, the NDP uh, has seen some gains in the last little week. Uh, and as we mentioned off the top, the liberals and conservatives pretty well neck and neck. So that could, uh, towards a minority, that could leave the NDP as a kingmaker. Uh, now, uh, Jagmeet Singh has obviously worked with Justin Trudeau for the last two years, but the NDP and the Conservatives, you don't really see working well together. Uh, how do you see that? Well, Mr. Singh sort of responded to that question already uh, and got some flack for it in a number of respects by saying, you know, whoever's 
uh, in government, if it's not us, uh, will we'll be uh, willing to, to work with them. Now, it's obvious when you compare platforms that uh, there's a lot more to work on from the NDP standpoint uh, with the liberals, in part because the liberals stole some of their ideas, quite frankly. Uh, but uh, from, from the conservative side, uh, it's going to be a little bit tougher. I can see some, uh, some way where they could reconcile on workers' rights, for example. Uh, the conservatives have come out pretty strongly on that part of their platform. Uh, I think, I think that's, uh, that is uh, Mr. O'Toole's doing, uh, trying to, to appeal to the union vote, which is not something that conservatives have been doing very well uh, in, in the past. So I, th I think there are some points on which they could work together, but, uh, but the agenda of a uh, you know, pseudo loose coalition between conservatives and NDP uh, would find the end of that agenda pretty quickly, I think. And, and, and I think the, uh, uh, the, the conservatives would have to try to find a new kingmaker, possibly along the Bloc Québécois, where obviously there are also uh, points of, um, uh, of reconciliation between the two parties, notably on the question of jurisdiction, uh, the, 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 uh, this idea of a federalism of partnership that appeals to uh, a, a Bloc Québécois uh, electorate. Uh, and, and, you know, Mr. O'Toole, again, made no secret that he was trying to, to, to steal some of the voters from, from the Bloc base. Now, in the past two weeks, I think we're seeing that that is probably not going to materialize at the polls today. Uh, but, uh, but I think uh, the, the bloc could also help bolster a conservative government if Mr. O'Toole finds himself in the, in the driver's seat. Scott, I'm wondering, you know, uh, uh, Jagmeet Singh and Aaron O'Toole working together, uh, is that something Canadians want to see? They, they, because let's face it, we have seen nothing where nobody wants to get along. It has to be one party's way or the highway. And I think Canadians are a little tired of the sort of the, the posturing and, and they just want to see things done. Do you think the, those two men can work together? What was a Bill Murray line from Ghostbusters? Cats and dogs living together. Yeah. You know, pure anarchy. It, it's entirely possible. Here's the thing about Canadian politics that I think a lot of Canadians don't realize is that almost the entire Canadian political spectrum would fit quite comfortably inside the Democratic Party in the United States. And we've seen that actually with the endorsements recently of Bernie Sanders endorsing uh, Singh and, and Hillary Clinton and, and Obama endorsing uh, Trudeau. So these three parties, if we could imagine a scenario where either one of them found themselves in a minority or a majority, what Canada would look like two, three, four years later wouldn't be wildly different. You know, Canadian parties, they, they do a lot of posturing on the stump, but when they're sitting in office, they almost all apply the exact same uh, ideology, which is very Canadian, and it's called muddling through. You know, <laughs> they'll work it along, there'll be some back and forth, but uh, it's it's not going to be the end of the days. We're not going to see the Stay Puff Marshmallow Man marching down uh, to, to take uh, Parliament Hill. It's, uh, it's going to look a lot like it did 32 days ago. Daryl, the Green Party, it seems it was done before. Can I just talk about the NDP for a second? Yeah, sure, I, jump in. I, I think it's uh, we're, uh, just another thought to put on the table uh, for everybody to consider. Sure. I, I'm um, actually really interested in the way that Jagmeet Singh has run this campaign. And the reason that I'm interested in it is he seems to have gone through a transition. I think when he came into his job, he thought he was Ed Broadbent, and now he thinks he's got the potential to be Jack Layton. And the difference between, because uh, Warren's old enough, maybe Scott is too, to remember all of this. Mm -hmm. uh, the difference between Ed Broadbent and Jack Layton was they had different missions. Ed Broadbent saw himself as the conscience of Parliament. Uh, his job was to uh, find a way to hold whoever was going to be in power to a minority, hopefully a Liberal Party, and be the conscience of Parliament to make sure that progressive legislation was passed in order to keep the Liberal government alive. Jack Layton, that was not his mission. His mission was to destroy the Liberal Party. He believed that there was going to be one progressive option. It was going to be the NDP. And he was prepared to even work with Stephen Harper, because remember, he kept him in power mm -hmm. twice in 2008 and 2006, uh, along with uh, you know a, a, a deflated Liberal Party. He didn't really want elections, but Jack Layton was an instrumental part of this, kept them alive because what he wanted to do was to destroy and displace the Liberal Party. And he certainly achieved that in 2011 to large measure. Now, in 2015, Thomas Mulcair could not continue with that, that mission, but that's the, the possibility. And if you watch Jagmeet Singh in this election campaign, even during the debate, which was the best time to see it, he never talked about Aaron O'Toole. 
He only went after Justin Trudeau. In fact, he agreed with Aaron O'Toole at least two or three times that I saw. So I think what's happened is that Jagmeet Singh is going through this transition from being Ed Broadbent to taking on the mission of Jack Layton, which makes the possibility of actually working with Aaron O'Toole or maybe working with the Bloc and, and Aaron O'Toole a serious possibility, not because of their agendas, because they're clearly different, but because he sees the um, the uh, uh, the uh, the Liberal Party as being, you know, the apostates of the progressive agenda. He wants to take that position. So I, I actually think there's more possibility of that than I think a lot of pundits are, are, are suggesting right now. What do you think, Warren? I agree, Daryl. I think that uh, Jigmeet has run a great campaign. At the outset of his leadership, he was a fiasco on fundraising, caucus relations. Uh, he couldn't get a seat in Parliament. You know, people were counting the days until his demise. He is an entirely different politician. And um, I didn't think he was terribly effective in the French debates, but it probably there wasn't a lot of pickup available for him there. But in the English debate, you know, he was one of the voices who dominated and that matters. And so shortly thereafter, Daryl and others started to show that he was uh, had momentum in places like the Lower Mainland and, in fact, was in first place for quite some time. So he's a capable politician, and that's a threat to Justin Trudeau because he's taking out of Trudeau's column. And, and, you know, that is the problem Trudeau's got at the end of this Seinfeldian election about nothing, is that you know, he's fighting a war on three fronts with the block resurging as a consequence of the debate stuff. Uh, the Tories resurging as a consequence of O'Toole is not a neo-Nazi. So that was hard for them to pin that on him. And then you've got Jagmeet Singh, who's learned to be a better leader. Trudeau is in a tight spot and it is entirely one of his own making. This was unnecessary, unwanted and potentially unsafe. We'll see today. And he's, I believe, going to pay a price for Stephanie, the Green Party, it seemed, was done before it started, the infighting, uh, losing an elected candidate as the campaign started. First off, can Annamie Paul win her seat? And secondly, will the others retain theirs? I do not see a path for Annamie Paul to win the seat in Toronto Centre. Uh, shy of a freaking miracle, uh, I, I, I really don't see how she can uh, dislodge Marcy Yen, uh, quite, uh, quite frankly. Um, the, uh, the seat in Fredericton where Jenica Atwin uh, won for the Greens in, in 2019 uh, before defecting uh, to the Liberals seems to be like a CPC, LPC race right now uh, from, from what I've seen and what I'm hearing uh, on, on the ground. Uh, it doesn't seem like uh, Nicole O'Byrne is going to be able to keep that one for the Greens. Uh, in fact, and, and I think this also speaks to Anime Paul, Nicole O'Byrne asked Anime Paul not to go to Fredericton because she thought that uh, it would do more harm than good to to her own campaign, but it doesn't seem like uh, uh, Miss O'Byrne's campaign has uh, has lifted off. Um, Elizabeth May seems like she's in a, in a, in a good position in uh, Sanish Gulf Islands. Uh, she might be the only uh, Green left after this election. Paul Manley, uh, it, it, his writing is not spoken for uh, at all. Uh, he seems like he he was having a hard time. Where we might see an interesting win might be in Kitchener Center. Uh, with the uh, the dropping of Raj Saini uh, from the Liberals after the uh, several allegations of, of uh, sexual misconduct, uh, it was kind of uh, a, a, a tie between uh, the NDP and the Greens, and it seems like Mike Morris has taken the lead there over Bezan Zubi. So, so that's going to be one to watch tonight for sure, and that would be uh, probably the only thing that would be considered a win for the Greens because it had uh, you know no gains in Ontario for. Um, at the federal level in their entire existence. Uh, obviously, it's not surprising that Kitchener would be a place where uh, the Greens would be able to, to come through, but, uh, but that, I think that would, be, uh, that, that, that would be nice for the Greens to have Mike Morris alongside Elizabeth May. You know, Scott, re regarding the Greens, uh, obviously it has not been a great way to run a campaign, start a campaign, and, and probably finish a campaign, but how does this party try and, and rebuild again? You know, John Iveson made uh, the National Post columnist made an interesting comment uh, yesterday on about how much he was enjoying following the the Singh campaign, and because, as he said it, uh, they're the last ones who actually believe what they're saying. And I actually I think the Greens possibly fall into that category as well. There's a real shortage of sincerity in Ottawa, and Canadians want to see more sincerity. Right now, I think even liberal voters don't necessarily believe that Trudeau is going to come through with half of his promises 
conservative voters are distrustful of O'Toole. They know that he moves back and forth depending on, on the audience and, and, and the day. And there's a real lack of authenticity. Um, P- Canadians realize that the vast majority of people who show up in Ottawa, um, maybe this is unfair, but I would say the you know, majority of people that show up in Ottawa are here because they want to be somebody, not because they want to do something. And the, what the Greens bring to the table and the NDP bring to the table is that they're just naive enough to think that they can they can make things better, they can change, they can implement their policies. And so if the NDP or Singh after the election can tap into that, I think there really is actually a future for these parties. I think that, that, that they are politics in a different way. They're more accessible. I think they're more representative of the nonpartisan Canadian. And uh, honestly, we, we, we need them. It would be nice to see those voices back in Parliament. Daryl, uh, the Bloc, uh, Bloc Québécois was sliding until the English language debate and then all of a sudden a reversal of fortune. Uh, what's a rejuvenated Bloc mean for the battleground of Quebec? Well, that was the place where Justin Trudeau was going to make up for what he lost potentially in Atlantic Canada and in Ontario. And it looks to me like based on the polling and consistently, not just ours, Leger, other polls, and I have a lot of time for Leger in Quebec. Um, the uh, it, it looks like the the block vote that lacked, uh, I would say, a spine until the debate now has developed a spine. I don't think that it's expanding. The block vote isn't expanding, but I think it's more animated. It's got more energy, and certainly Blanchette's numbers have been going up since the debate. Uh, it's given them a reason to you know focus back on what traditionally drives. Uh, drives uh, block voters uh, um, in, in the province, just like Pekists. And uh, so I think that uh, the, the role that they're going to play is not so much uh, in terms of their own position in parliament, although if we get into minority negotiations, it could have, uh, they could have more of a role. But what it's going to do is deny Justin Trudeau the place where he really needed to do well in order to win his majority. Because frankly, he'd already, Trudeau's already won everything he's going to win in Ontario. He's probably going to lose some today. Uh, and in British Columbia, they're running in third in most of the polls that I'm seeing. So there's no place of any substance where they can make up what they lose in in, in Ontario. So they've got to win in a place like Quebec where there's 78 seats. And it looks like they're going to do no better this time than the last time. Maybe they'll swap, swap a couple of seats back and forth. Maybe they'll pick up one from the Conservatives or whatever, but not 10, not 15. Mm-hmm. Uh, Warren, uh, the riding of Vancouver, Granville, Jody Wilson-Raybould, obviously not running. So that means there's no incumbent in that riding. But do you see that as being a bellwether for the final result of the election? No, because the Liberal candidate, he's the skipper of house flippers um, and a pretty disreputable person from what I know, the people I've been speaking to in Vancouver. So the Liberals richly deserve to, um, to lose there. Um, but, you know, you give me an opportunity to talk about uh, my friend. I think uh, Jody Wilson-Raybould is the type of person that Scott was talking about earlier. That is what we need in our politics. At the end of this painful, unnecessary 36-day exercise, I think, you know, a lonely nation is going to turn its eyes to people like Jody and whatever political party she comes back to. And I, I don't know if she will, but... That's what we need more of because this campaign has been cynical and dishonest and uninspiring. And uh, I don't know what impact that will have on turnout, but God knows we need some change in Ottawa. And uh, the people, the options that are there at the moment don't seem to be delivering it. All right, folks, uh, we're coming up to the end and let's uh, let's just go around the horn. Uh, Predictions, uh, just final predictions. We'll go with numbers and we'll start with you, Stephanie. What do you expect is going to be the result of tonight? A minority. I have no idea which color, to be quite honest. (laughs) Scott? Reduced liberal minority. All right, Daryl. You know, every election, I usually know better than any, just about anybody, because I have access to data. I legitimately can say today, I simply don't know. I agree with Stephanie. I think that that's the most accurate assumption. I mean, if the, you know, if you change one point in Ontario or, you know, in the 905, five or six seats go over from one side to the other. So, uh, you know, I don't disagree with Scott's assessment. I, I think that that's probably a, a very logical conclusion, but I don't think it's, a, I don't even think he would argue it's a, it's a certain conclusion. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's the most confusing election I, I remember since 2004. What do you think, Warren? Any prediction? 
Well, when uh, he was in majority territory, I thought Trudeau would get a minority. I'm not sure about that anymore, anymore but I, you know, I feel better now saying what Daryl and Stephanie has said. I, I don't have a clue. Uh, it makes it more fun for those of us who comment on elections, maybe not so fun for the country, but like, I don't know. So I guess we're going to find out. We've never had an election, well, we haven't in a century during a pandemic before. Um, and I think that's going to be a fairly large factor in turnout and people's attitudes and so on. So I guess people have to tune in and find out. All right. Uh, well, I want to thank our guest today on Unpublished TV, Warren Kinsella, political commentator and special advisor to Prime Minister Jean Chrétien. Daryl Bricker, the CEO of Ipsos Public Affairs. Scott Gilmore is a columnist with McLean's Magazine. And Stephanie Schwinnard, assistant professor of political science at Queen's University. Coming up on our next Unpublished TV, we'll talk about vaccine mandates. Thanks for watching Unpublished TV. Stay safe. I'm Ed Hand.